Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 213th session of the online optom learning series OLS. And for today's session, we have with us Dr. Janelia Davison. Uh, Dr. Davison is an award-winning optometrist who graduated in the year 2006 from the Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salis University. And she has over 17 years of private practice experience. She's been awarded uh, by various awards. One of it includes the most influential woman in optical for innovation by Vision Monday in 2022. Uh, she has been helping a lot of uh, young optometrists and people who want to take optometry as a profession as well. And she is the founder and the owner of the Brilliant Eye Vision Center and Premier Dry Eye Spa, which is located in Georgia, US. She is also the co-founder and the chief visionary officer uh, of a software-based company which provides optical solutions as well. Additionally, she is also co-founder of SCORE, which is a non-profit organization dedicated to empowering young women of color interest in pursuing a career in optometry. Uh, she has been involved in various organizations. She sits on the advisory boards and a member of the American Optometric Association, the National Optometric Association, Elite Optometry Divas, and, and many such organizations where she you know, sits and takes decisions and says her expertise. She's authored a couple of papers and also books as well, and uh, she enjoys uh, her life with her husband husband and two children as well. So welcome uh, Dr. Davison onto our platform and thank you for uh, you know spending this Sunday morning all the way uh, for us today and let me just leave the screen time to you please. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, so yes, I'm going to try to clear this little box. So yes, my name is Janelle Davison. I bring you greetings from Metro Atlanta, Georgia in the U.S. It is a bright, sunny, early um, Sunday morning here. So I've had my coffee. I'm excited. And every now and then you'll see me um, take a little sip of water. So we'll get in. And so um, this is one of my favorite talks. Um, this talk allows me to be able to introduce um, some other therapies and options that may be available for your patients who are suffering from ocular surface disease, specifically dry eye disease. Um, as it was stated, I've been practicing been for 17 years. I know I look young. Um, and 15 of those in private practice. And then of the last about eight years with a really deep dive in my private practice on ocular surface disease with an emphasis on dry eye disease. Um, I have a special passion for dry eye disease. Um, one, because it helps to improve patients, patients' lives. But two, I'm also a dry eye sufferer myself. So it gives me um, a good advantage to be able to speak and communicate with my patients and kind of foster compliance. But it's important to know what options are out there. Some of the things that, will, that I'll speak about will be available um, across global, and some of them may be only available specifically to the U.S. But if you're anything like me, you have a thirst for knowledge, and I always like to know what options are available out there. I always stay on top of the research because something may not be available quite yet in the U.S., but I know as time comes, if things prove to be effective, eventually they'll make their way over here. And I'm sure the same happens where you are. <clears throat> this is not a COPE approved, so I don't have to worry about any of these disclosures. Um, he already gave me a beautiful introduction. Those are my kids there. Um, they got to leave the U.S. We took them to Jamaica this summer, so they had a great time um, starting to explore other areas. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about some objectives here. I always like to kind of level set my talks, and so I don't like to assume that everybody's on the same playing field as far as their approach to dry eye disease, their ability to diagnose it, um, see where some of the, um, where dry eye is going. You're going to learn that dry eye, um, the face of dry eye is changing. Uh, we're noticing that more and more young people are experiencing dry eye disease. So it's very important to know what options are available out there because the, the, the face that we thought of dry eye is completely changing. And then just some new things that are in the pipeline or things that may already be available. As I did this talk, this talk, I did this lecture about a year or so ago. And every time I have to go in and re-update because some things that I'll say was in a pipeline or on the horizon have now been approved for us to use in the U.S. So we'll see how those things just transpire over time. <clears throat> 
But this is just, just some dry eye basics. I um, always like to let you know my colleagues know if you're not deep into dry eye. You know, at one point, dry eye was just dry eye. We didn't know. We thought it was a symptom. We didn't realize that dry eye was a condition that was a disease that led to changes on the ocular surface. And so getting a playbook and understanding some of the treatment protocols and some of the algorithms out there help us to better understand the disease state, understand that it's chronic aggressive, um, and we know the importance of stepping in and intervening and properly managing our patients. And so a lot of my colleagues that, that want to say every day what we call primary care, you know, what protocols should I use? So a lot of my protocols that I've used, I've kind of made those my own based on my patient base over time. But I started with some of the three basic protocols that are here. Um, so what we call clinical algorithms. And I'm getting to notice that my internet is stable. So um, if I go out or I freeze, um, hopefully um, uh, you can text me to let me know. But the DOOS2 um, algorithm, CEDARS algorithm, and ASCRS. And so each slide will kind of go into what those algorithms mean, how they have a different approach um, to dry eye. And they just kind of give you a playbook on how you may want to incorporate dry eye into your practice. These algorithms are great because sometimes you need to know what to look for, what to do, and then kind of what to do if your initial treatment plan is not working for that patient. And that's the important part with dry eye. Um, you have to understand it is multifactorial. And in most cases, it's just not going to be one monotherapy that's going to get that patient to the outcome that they want. A lot of times you're going to be using multiple therapies sometimes together, um, or you start one and bring them back in 30 days, you have to add another one because they're not reaching those endpoints that they want for our symptoms and clinical presentations. So first we'll start with the TFOS dues too. Um, and that stands for the Tear Film and Aqua Surface Society Dry Eye Workshop. And so there was a workshop um, in 2007 and that helped to kind of formulate the definition of dry eye disease. And then as dry eye became more mainstream, the more we learned about dry eye disease, in 2017, DOOS-2 came out, and that really honed in on the definition of dry eye disease. Um, and in this definition, we note that dry eye indicates a loss of homeostasis, a tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, and we know that there's inflammation that's involved. And that's important. Anytime there's an inflammatory process that is happening in the body, that's going to potentially keep up the chronicity of the condition. And... Um, increase the chances of surface damage. And that we know we should do treatment based on severity. And so this definition down here just digs deep into some of the main points that you want to take out when you're managing patients with dry eye disease. Like I said, it's multifactorial and that's important. It's usually more than one thing that is causing the clinical signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. And anytime you have something that has multi-factors, to think that one set thing is going to be able to properly manage that patient, sometimes it's going to lead you down to a, a road of frustration, um, instability, hypoosmolarity, inflammation, and also we're learning more about neurosensory abnormalities um, that play um, a key role into being to properly manage these patients. Um, so CEDARS, this is another algorithm that you can use to help manage patients who have drug disease. It digs a little bit deeper than the TFOS dues too. Um, it's developed from the Corneal External Disease and Refractor Society. Um, it really breaks down and cause, tries to compartmentalize um, a lot of the symptoms with dry disease. We know some of the symptoms are very overlapping, and sometimes you really have to good, have a good, have a good diagnostic ability to really know that this may be dry eye disease or manifestation of dry eye disease versus what. And the CEDARS algorithm refers to as masquerators. So other things that could be masquerading as dry eye disease, but it's not. And if you kind of go down the wrong path, you'll be trying to manage a patient and not able to reach those endpoints. But it focuses on splitting up aqueous deficiency and evaporative and really drilling down to evaporative dry eye and blepharitis, MGD, goblet cell deficiency, and exposure, and then those masqueraders or those co-conspirators, which are things that may be contributing to dry eye, um, like exposure-related dry eye, so exposure keratitis, um, SLK, other things that will give a lot of some of those symptoms and maybe some of those presentations um, from your patient that's in your chair, but it may not be specifically dry eye disease. So this kind of helps to 
bring to the forefront that there's other things than co-conspirators that we should be thinking about to help us better manage those patients and that there's a lot of overlapping symptoms with dry eye disease. Another one that's very important, if you manage patients for um, cataract surgery, refractive surgery here in the U.S., optometrists, we don't do any surgery 98% of the time, but we do a lot of co-management. And so knowing now that um, most of our cataract patients that are ready for cataract surgery, um, 50% of those patients have um, central corneal staining, 50% of them have abnormal MMP9 or tear osmolarity. And we know from the definition of dry eye disease, inflammation and hyperosmolarity equate to dry eye disease. And MMP9 evaluates the level of inflammation within the tears. And so if we're managing these patients and we're sending them for cataract surgery, but their ocular surface is not ready, in most cases, they're not going to reach those endpoints that, that we want. You know, we, I see that all the time. You know, I was fine before I had the cataract surgery. I feel like my vision is worse. And no, the vision is better. It's just the ocular surface wasn't dealt with before they had cataract surgery. And so they're dealing with a lot of, with those symptoms and signs afterwards that's prohibiting from them experiencing and enjoying the fact that they have that cataract removed. And so the ASCRS, which is the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, really wants practitioners to get into the habit of categorizing your patients and looking for ocular surface and dry eye disease before scheduling cataract surgery or refractive surgery, which would be like LASIK, PRK, things of that nature, and compartmentalize those patients into um, non-significant, um, non-visually significant ocular surface disease, meaning we see some things, they're minor, we, we may initiate some easy home therapy, or that's something we're going to watch a little bit more closely after the surgery, or visually significant ocular surface disease, meaning that patient has positive MP9 levels, um, it demonstrates hyperosmolarity, their central corneal staining, that patient's in a bad state. So we definitely would not want to send them for cataract surgery because we know it's going to affect all the measurements a lot of times that we do to get this patient ready for cataract surgery, like the topographies, the keratometries, and environmentary readings. And so I always kind of like the level set just to see, so you all can see what are some of the guidelines? And these guidelines are easily found online for you to print them out, kind of make them your own, post them in your office, and that help give you a guideline on how to kind of approach patients that have these symptoms and you see some signs um, when you are managing these patients. In practice, I always kind of, I do a lot of dry eye and every patient that comes in that I may see some signs of dry eye may not be heavily symptomatic or we have some that are symptomatic, but may not be ready for your advanced treatments or prescription medication. And so I have what's called my foundational approach. This is, this is what I usually do when it's very early and they're not asymptomatic to kind of let them know that this is potentially a progressive chronic condition. Or when I see some very mild signs or mild symptoms, um, these are some approaches that I like to have, which is important if you see a lot of primary care at the same time. Some colleagues have a dry eye disease and ocular surface focus clinic and that's all they do and it's a little bit easier but if you come like myself i can have a, a dry eye evaluation and right after that i'm going to contact lens exam the glasses exam and then i'm working somebody up for glaucoma and so my practice is pretty busy so i have to be able to kind of compartmentalize and so we want to know some of the risk factors for dry eye disease and so we have risk factors that are considered your intrinsic risk factors for dry eye. So that things that means things that are just within that you can't change and it increases your risk for um, dry eye disease. Of course, we know females are more at risk. Um, the older population, um, also hormones and decreased androgens. Um, any females have any hormone replacement um, therapy, autoimmune disorders in dry eye. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's are some of your big ones that are associated with that. Then we have what's called your extrinsic risk factors for dry eye. And so things that are done on the outside that increase the risk for dry eye disease. So most postmenopausal estrogen therapy, medications, um, a gamut. I would say most of the medications that we take on down to our medications that are our, our dry eye, I'm sorry, our allergy, medications that help us sleep, medications that manage diabetes, they all cause they affect the tear film, which is going to increase the patient's risk of dry eye disease. Vitamin A deficiency, the environment. So the environment can include, you know, computer device time. If you live in very dry environments like here in the U.S., if you live out west in Arizona, um, those areas where it's not as humid, 
diet low in omega three and six, three and six refractive surgery. So when we talked before, if you already have some signs and symptoms of dry eye disease, surgery, any surgery is going to ex ex exacerbate that. So we definitely want to have those um, that surface dealt with. Contact lens wear and then cosmetics and skincare. So if you were on last week, Dr. Pam Terrio talked about some of those things found in cosmetics and skincare. But dry eye is getting younger. I did a big um, article on opt in optometric management in 2022 on how the face of dry eye is getting younger. In that poll, you can see dry eye disease in youth. Um, about 22% of late adolescent girls um, exhibit signs and symptoms of dry eye disease and about 13% of adolescent boys. And so um, I have an early adolescent daughter and she actually has dry eyes. She has some myoglobin gland dysfunction um, and she actually has some um, lack of thomas. And so her eyes are dry most of the time. And so we have to understand that that face of dry eye is changing. Um, you know, we initially think of dry eye, we think of that baby boomer, baby boomer category, which is 56 to 75 and generation X. And we know, of course, you, the older you are, you're going to be more at risk for dry eye, but your millennials and your Gen Z, you see those ages there. A lot of my patients in that are in my practice, they fall within that millennial range and the upper part of Gen Z. So my late 20 year olds, the mid 20s are coming in with um, signs and symptoms of dry eye. And we are associating that, associating that with increased screen time, poor diets and environment. Environment really being the exorbitant amount of time that is spent on computers and devices. So we know all of this, that dry eye is very prevalent. You have to have a way to be able to screen for dry eye disease in clinical practice. There's no more way, numerous ways to screen. One of the easiest non-invasive is to do a, a survey. Um, I do the ocular surface index score um, to be able to survey my patients. Um, I like it because you can download the app on the iPad and it makes it very easy, easy for me to incorporate it into clinical practice. Um, when it first came out, you had to do a lot of calculation on a piece of paper. They made it pretty easy. Um, it makes it look tech savvy. So patients like tech savvy. A lot of my patients are in that millennial which is Z range. And so it looks really cool to be able to have these questionnaires done on a um, tablet. Or you can do a speed questionnaire. Or some doctors have these probing questions, three or four probing questions that they ask during the clinical history to be able to kind of elicit possibly that this patient may be experiencing some early signs of dry eye disease. Other ways to screen, if you want to be able to have in clinical practice, is screening myography. We talked about dry eye disease is more prevalent in the younger populations, and a lot of it has to do with the device time. And so we know increased device time is going to affect how well the oil glands function. So having a way to be able to screen for those oil glands within clinical practice. And so at that bottom screen, the nine-year-old gland structure, that is my daughter. And so I treat her with various... Um, therapies to help manage her symptoms of dry eye. And something that you can do as well if you're not able to have screening myographer is just make sure you're actually touching the, the glands. You know, I have my patients when I'm doing a slip lamp examination, I always make sure I have them look down so that I can examine their lid margin. But I also have them look up and I actually press along the lid margin to see if I'm able to get any myoglobin out, what it looks like. Um, and that kind of helps the guy some more of that conversation and help me understand how I may want to approach this patient. This is another object here. I don't know if you can see my pointer. That's really easy to get and in my pocket. It helps you to express the glands as well. Non-invasive. The, the concept behind it is that you get the same amount of pressure each time. And I use it, but I prefer to actually just use my thumb and go across and be able to express to see what the myobone quality looks like. And this is a Grady scale here. And these are some other ways to be able to express the glands. You want to diagnose dry eye early um, and some easy ways and vital dyes in clinic. Um, sodium fluorescein, so you can take a look at the tear breakup time. There are cool, cool ways now to do non-invasive tear breakup time. Um, some of these machines are costly. And so if you're not able to be able to bring that technology into practice, it doesn't mean that you can't begin the diagnostic process early. Um, you just use some of your vital dyes and look for corneal staining. I will say if you see corneal staining on a patient, that means they the disease has really progressed. It's chronic. It's been there a while. And you definitely want to have a process to be able to intervene. 
with some other cool diagnostic things that are out. Um, Scout Pro is a way to be able to test um, osmolarity. We know that anytime that the um, there's loss of homeostasis, you're going to have an increase in osmolarity. And so anything above 300 AM OSM milliliters, um, it's equivalent or equal to dry eye disease. And so that can be your guiding point to see your therapy working as that numbers begin to come down. Um, you have the inflammatory testing here that tests MMP9 levels. Um, and so they indicate signs of inflammation um, within the tears. And you can use this as a guide to as those numbers or that um, device shows that there's no signs of inflammation within the eye that you've kind of hit some of your endpoints in managing that patient. And then some of the foundational treatment, the intervene early. These are some things that you can have within clinical practice. If you see patients who are at greater risk, some of the very, very early stages of dry eye, um, these are things that you can easily recommend. Lubricants, warm compresses, um, really focus on lid hygiene, um, having that conversation with clean makeup, and of course, nutraceuticals. And then treatment options over the years have really just kind of expanded. We went from just take artificial tears to punctal plugs became a big thing and then drops. And you'll see as we go through the rest of this presentation that we've gone beyond all three of these options to be able to manage our patients. And so if you have a real passionate interest in dry eye disease and ocular surface disease, the sky's the limit. Research is constantly advancing. New therapies are coming out. So almost every couple months, I have to stay on top of what's available for our patients to be able to manage their symptoms. And so I like to go through here and I won't spend a lot of time. Some of these drops will be available where you are. Some of them will not. But I only usually have this part of the presentation to show that drops are not the only answer. Not all drops have 100% efficacy. So that means you prescribe a drop. Not all 100% of your patients are going to respond um, both symptom-wise and clinical-wise for um, improvement. And that's important to know because we talked about before that drop disease is multifactorial. And so a lot of times you will need more than one option. So you may need a prescription medication and something else to manage that condition. But to understand, you know, how doctors will say, well, they presented with this, I saw signs and I wrote a prescription and they didn't get better. I, I don't like dry. It takes too much dry, um, cure time. Well, it has to understand that every prescription was meant to work for 100% of patients. And so some of the early prescription options here in the U.S. was cyclosporin. Um, cyclosporin was thought to block cell lymphocyte activation, infiltration, and inflammatory cytokines. Um, it doesn't have 100% efficacy. Um, only after three months of using a medication, um, about 72% of those patients um, had improvement, right? And so three months means the patient has to be committed um, it works better if their symptology is low, because if you're heavily symptom, um, symptomatic, taking something that's going to take about three months, really get in the system to be able to be impactful. And then at that case, only 70% efficacy. Um, some doctors who were initially prescribing or um, dry eye disease with this medication will get a little bit frustrated. But it's important to know that what some of these um, studies show us and that we can properly communicate with our patients on what to expect when we're prescribing these medications if they're available. And then um, about 2017, 2018, um, we had another option to prescribe our patients here in the U.S. with um, dry eye signs and symptoms. Um, Lefitograss, it blocks T-cell recruitment and activation, um, and it helps to minimize inflammation. So that's going to reduce uh, the amount of foundatory bonds that are on the surface and new bonds. And so that was groundbreaking that anything that was a new inflammatory bond and what was already on the surface, lipidograss could address. And so it did penetrate the ocular surface and reduce inflammation a lot faster for a lot of patients. So we didn't necessarily have to wait that three months to be able to see some improvement in the symptoms and signs for patients. But once again, we had about 70% efficacy. So that means when you write the script, not all of your patients are going to be able to respond and reach those clinical endpoints that you want. Um, cortical steroids actually work very well. Um, the only thing is that you can't have a patient with a chronic condition. And we know um, dry eye disease is chronic and passive on a cortical steroid drop for months and years on end because it can increase um, other potential issues with the ocular, um, with the eye, with increasing eye pressure and things that of that nature. 
but it acutely reduces um, symptoms of and signs of dry eye disease. Um, this works really well in my practice for some of my millennial patients and my Gen Z, where they are very early. So a lot of their structure is still healthy and good, but they're exhibiting signs and symptoms of dry eye because of exacerbated computer and device time. And sometimes they come in, I'm able to put them on a critical steroid, a low dose steroid, calm them down, educate them on a disease process and put them on that functional approach and get them in a better pipeline of how often they need to see me so that we can properly manage their condition. And these are some um, critical steroids that um, are effective for managing patients with signs and symptoms of dry eye disease, but like the potential side effects in term use. And then kind of what do you do when drops are not enough? This is one of my patients here that um, was referred to me by an actual colleague, and it was her sister. So she was seeing another optometrist in the area, and she had been treated with numerous things. You can see at the bottom, she filled with cyclosporin, lipidograss, um, tea tree oil cleansers, over-the-counter tears, allergy drops. I mean, you name it, she did it, and she never reached the end point of that, that she wanted. And even the day that she came in to see me, you see her tear lake was extremely low for somebody that had been taking cyclosporin as well as there was some corneal staining. And so, you know, here in the U.S., you know, we only think that drops are going to be the answer. When we have a patient like this, we'll get kind of feel like we hit a brick wall. Like, what do we do next? And so this is me showing a frustrated doctor here. Like, what, what do I do? Uh, this patient is complaining. I've tried everything under the sun. I threw the kitchen sink at them and they are still not better. And so that's when you have to kind of think about and stay abreast of what are some of the advanced therapies and treatments that are out there. Um, you know, I'm primary care, but I have a big focus on ocular surface disease and dry eye. And it takes up a lot of time. You know, I have to really stay abreast um, through clinical, um, through literature, through conferences, through colleagues of what is available for patients because I still hit these brick walls. And a lot of times now I get a lot of these patients. You saw that patient, everything that she had done, and somebody referred her to me and they, her sister was an optometrist. And so, you know, the pressure was high. This is my a colleague's sister who has been seen by another optometrist and everything has failed. And now she's in my chair. And so I have to be able to know what are some things that are available to manage those patients. And so one thing that we do forget about a lot of times we're managing patients with dry eye disease, evaporative dry eye, MDG, MGD is the lid margin. We learned a lot about demodex blepharitis. Um, even here in the U.S. recently, there was a drop that was just approved for us to properly be able to manage those patients. But demodex blepharitis um, has multiple ways that it does affect the ocular surface. There's a mechanical bacteria and chemical. Um, mechanically, if the ocular surface, you can see how it affects the lid margins. You have these various um, collarettes, and the collarettes is kind of made of some of the um, debris and um, uh, nice way to say might poop uh, <laughs> from the demodex overnight that make a kind of a housing along the lid margin. You can see I'm, I don't have a little pointer here, but how right at the tip of where the lash comes out, you see like these little um, buildup of these uh, uh, fluorescent areas here, very thick. And those are the endpoints of the um, the demodex, the collarettes, and we know the more collarettes you have, the, that's more indicative of demodex and kind of the cutoff we're using is 10 or more collarettes um, kind of differentiates demodex blepharitis from just blepharitis, but it does really affect how the lash comes out of the limb margin. Um, it, in a bacterial level, it can contribute to um, immune response on the surface, so it can keep that inflammation up on the front surface of the eye, um, and then Chemically, the demodex mice have been associated with altering the mybum composition. So we know if the mybum composition is too thick, if it's inflamed, if it's altered, it's not going to be able to mix well with the um, tears that are naturally made, and that's going to affect the stability of the um, tear film. Um, and this just goes a little bit deeper to some of those clinical modifications of demodex blepharitis. Um, it increases inflammation, disorder of eyelashes, myeloma gland dysfunction, lid margin inflammation, which all of these things you see in a patient who has a lot of times evaporative dry eye and what's causing their tear film to evaporate too quickly. They may be experiencing demodex, blepharitis, and MGD. So you have to have a proper way to be able to manage that. The way to easily diagnose demodex blepharitis, the easiest way is to actually have the person look down I've learned not to have them close their eyes because they have this tightened response. And sometimes you can't really get a good look of 
the colorex on the lid margin. So I tell the patient just to look down, look down towards their toes. And I just kind of start nasally and I just move across the lid margin. And then sometimes if you just touch the top of the lid while they're looking down, you can get a very good um, way to be able to see the base of that lid margin. And I just start counting the number of colorets that I see and I document that in my chart. Um, it's important because there's a high correlation with demodex blepharitis in patients that we diagnose with dry eye disease. Um, there was a study done, a Titan study of over a thousand patients um, in a OMD and MD practice. And we see that there was a correlation between demodex blepharitis and with dry eye diagnosis about neck and neck, 55%. Another study done of uh, just under 200 patients in New York um, looking at epilating the lashes and looking for um, demodex blepharitis as compared to the other study that counted the number of colorets. Even still, demodex blepharitis found 50% of the time with 68% of the time associated with dry eye diagnosis. And so when we're managing patients with dry eye disease, we cannot forget about demodex blepharitis because that may be a reason why you're not reaching those endpoints. And so we know through Ryerson's theory that demodex, um, dry eye disease and blepharitis go kind of hand in hand. And so we have to have a way to be able to manage that. And so um, things that I use in practice is blepex. That's a um, an automated way to be able to go along the lid margin and clean the lids and lashes. We have something that's called Zest that uses a zocular um, solution that's okra based to go in and remove and reduce some of that biofilm. Um, and the biofilm is what contributes to that buildup of inflammation and causes damage to the front surface. And so this is a patient of mine that came in for a routine eye exam. And you can see here, um, she wanted to update glasses and contact lenses. And if I'm doing the slit lamp, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't dress this and just fit her with contact lenses. And so you can see that there's various amounts of colorets. And so this will be definitely considered demodex blepharitis. Um, in her case, um, she came in before we had a topical therapy available, but I had her come back and I did one of those in-office cleansings. And I actually did a combination of a zest cleaning as well as your automated Blefx or AB Max cleaning um, to get her lid margin better. So we did two rounds of zest and automated micro exfoliation. So we used an uh, AB Max cleanser. And so um, just here in the U.S., I was able to write a prescription for a drop now that's going to be available. Um, you know, just a quick, because right now it's only available in the U.S., um, but it's a topical medication that is available to manage um, demodex blepharitis. Um, it's a loader lanner ophthalmic solution, and it actually came out of the veterinarian space. And so it's been re-engineered and reformulated to be able to be safe on the ocular surface to specifically eradicate demodex blepharitis. All of our therapies before would kind of reduce the presentation, um, but patients had to come in on regular occurrences to be able to be managed and clean and off of this because we didn't have anything that would really eradicate them. We thought tea tree oil based cleansers did, but we're learning now that this is going to be one of a, a game changer as far as managing patients with um, demodex blepharitis. These are just some of the studies that show how effective the medication was taken twice a day over six weeks to be able to eradicate um, the cholerets and demodex blepharitis. Um, some of the adverse events, um, typically with topical drops that we instill, the biggest one was pain and burning and stinging at sight. We had the next coming in with a little bit of redness, but the thing that shows it doesn't invade any of your current Oculus, the dry eye state that you're managing, um, and it makes those, it reaches those end points within about six weeks to help better manage those patients with dry eye. So this particular patient may be somebody that is taking a topical medication to help with the inflammation of the front surface of the eye, like a cyclosporin, and do a course of this particular medication to really manage the um, demodex blepharitis on the front surface of the eye. So multifactorial, you probably will need more than one option to be able to manage these patients. And so this part moves into some of the different light therapies that are available um, to manage patients with dry eye disease. Um, you know, we're finding other therapies that were used in other spaces as far as healthcare to manage patients uh, with spectrums of light. 
that are becoming, we're learning more about them and knowing that they're very effective in the ocular surface disease, um, dry eye lid management space as well. And so low light level therapy is a therapy that um, has very good amount of studies that are out to show that low light level therapy is effective with managing inflammation and um, with, with other parts of the body. But we're seeing now that that soft tissue around the eye, that periodical tissue, you can get an illicit responses there to be beneficial for managing patients with dry eye disease, specifically myobian gland dysfunction, as well as demodex blepharitis. And so the absorption of this light um, increases APT production and increases intracellular reactive oxygen species and ATP activation. And so these light level therapies usually work in three different spaces, but two of them are very um, common in the ocular space, which we call blue light and red light. Blue light works in about the 460, 65 nanometer space, and red light works at the 640 space. Red light is really good to help on that cellular level with the myobin within the myobian glands. And then the blue light at that level is thought to have a bacteriostatic um, benefit. So it works really well dealing with um, possibly the demodex blepharitis on a cellular level. Um, and you can combine the two lights um, when you're working with patients. And these are ways that you can um, treat the patient using low light level therapy. Proximity is important when you're dealing with the soft tissues around the eye. The closer you get it to the eye, um, the more effective the treatment. And so we have what's called the hood version, which is here on the left. And then you have a mask version. Um, both of the I, I offer the hood version in my office. And a lot of times I um, offer that in conjunction with several other therapies that I may be doing, just trying to help patients reach those endpoints. Intense post light therapy in that poll question works in the 500 to 1200 nanometer space. Um, there's a lot of clinical studies and trials um, talking about um, the benefits of in post light therapy in managing dry eye disease, MGD. There is a um, device here in the U.S. now that is actually approved um, for low, um, sorry, intense post light therapy specifically for dry eye. Um, but um, IPO back in, I think, in the late 2000s, um, Dr. Rolando Toyos um, was the one that kind of really um, uh, ex found the connection between intense post light therapy and being able to manage patients that have dry eye disease, specifically MGD. Um, we know it has, we call it a kind of our trifecta because it can treat upstream and downstream inflammatory regulators. So it's helped with inflammation on the front surface of the eye. And we know through the definition of DUDE2 that there's inflammation. Um, it works specifically with inflammation that is from ocular rosacea, which is these telogentagic blood vessels that are along the lid margin, which is very similar to facial rosacea. But we know now you can have those specifically around the periorbital tissues in the lid margin, and that's going to increase and keep up inflammatory um, state of the eye. Um, it works by um, regressing the blood vessels that are associated with that. Also, it helps with liquefaction of the myobum inside of the myobian gland. So the heat allows that myobum to be liquefied so it's easy to express. So that way you can remove some of those blockages. And then also works on um, eradicating demodex. And so typically you have to treat the patient with about three to four treatments, um, about two to three weeks apart um, to be able to get those clinical signs and symptoms to improve. These are just some of the studies that have been done that show the benefits of intense post light therapy and managing ocular surface disease, specifically MGD. So this is a patient here that I have that I treated um, using a 650 nanometer filter fluency at eight joules, um, which is a little bit lower than what you normally see. Um, this specific device that I use, um, the indication is there after you approve the U.S., but it's not necessarily FDA approved for MGD and dry eye disease. And I have, and I use it off label because I have a lot of patients that have darker skin tones and you may know through IPL, if you don't have the right filter and you can't control the energy that you can really cause some changes in the melanin in the skin. Um, you actually make them lose some of that melanin, but this particular device allows me to be able to treat pretty much all skin types, Fitzpatrick skin types um, without being able to affect some of that skin tissue, meaning, 
really because I can work at longer wavelengths and I can really control the fluency of the of the, of the jewels. And then I can work at those higher wavelengths as um, those lower wavelengths as well. And I can move the fluency up, you see here. But pointing here, you see this patient had some aquarization and after treatment, you notice that the lip margin is less red. You see less of those blood vessels that are on that lip margin. This is a patient who is a darker skin tone, Fitzpatrick 5. Um, patients are darker skin tone can have aquarizations as well. And there are studies that are shown, have been done out of Saudi Arabia, that um, uh, a good percentage of patients that present with signs and symptoms of dry disease of color have aquarization. You just got to look pretty hard along the lip margin. I encourage you with a slit lamp, even if they're darker skin, skin type 5 or 6, look, especially if they have symptoms of redness, burning, um, excessive tearing. Look at that lid margin and see if you see aquarization or these telangiectasia blood vessels. Um, and treating this patient with the filter 650 fluency between 8 and 9 improve their um, aqua surface index score to 16 from severe and increase their tear breakup time by two seconds. And you can see that lid margin looks um, a lot healthier. We have thermal pulsation. And so thermal pulsation really heats and liquefies the myobum, but expressions and expression of getting rid of that myobum is important. And so um, there's a device that we use um, here in the U.S. called LipaFlow. Um, so it heats and um, excavates on its own, but a patient really has to have about 60% or more functional myobian glands in order for that treatment to kind of be effective and minimizes some of their symptoms. So if you do my biography and see that they really don't have any glands left. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but you need to be able to communicate to the patient that this is one adjunct therapy that we're going to do. We're going to, you know, offer as many treatments as we can to try to reset some of those symptoms, get you closer back to baseline. But you have more of a option for a positive outcome if they have sixty percent or more. Um, so this would be more if, if the patient is very early in the condition and they start to have regular symptoms. This works very well for them. Thermal pulsation. So this is liquid flow. Um, the, another device that's out that's called Tear Care, and you see it works by using smart lid technology. And so it uses the same amount of heat across the eye, top and bottom lid simultaneously for 15 minutes, but you do have to manually express fake patients to keep their eyes open or closed. And so it's good if you have somebody has to do some work, they can sit there and have this treatment and you come right in and express afterwards. These are some studies that show that tear care um, data, um, some superiority to the Lipaflow um, treatment that was kind of the gold standard um, back in the mid 2000s. That was one of the only in office treatments that we had. Um, but tear care was very, it's been very successful in reducing the ocular surface index score. Um, I've been very successful with this treatment in my practice. And once again, very rarely do I do this treatment alone because uh, unfortunately I'm getting more patients in, referred to me with moderate to severe dry eye. But if you catch people early, and that's the goal now when you are able to identify who's at risk and what some of these symptoms may equate to, you can step in early. And sometimes you get them early, one treatment may be what's all that's needed to kind of reset that patient. Here's another one that's called ILUX differences. Do you do this? Um, the person who's running has to do that themselves. You stand there, you have a little window that you can see to the, uh, as you're expressing it while you're heating. Um, and there's another one that's called MyBuffalo. Um, it's That's me over there doing that one. It requires a person to actually do it, but it's thermoelectric heat and it's heating the outside of the um, lids. There's no consumables. Um, this is a good adjunct therapy that I do on my patients as well. And then um, I'm going to be rolling, closing up. I have a lot of slides. There's a lot of material to get through in 45 minutes. But radio frequency, um, it's using a certain level of heat to create a thermal injury that results in collagen production. So it came from a lot of your dermatology spaces that we know using that around the periorbital tissue, um, that collagen um, regeneration helps to helps with lid elasticity. So we know that as we age, our lid um, elasticity changes and that affects our blink. And so we know if we can tighten those lids around um, using this therapy, it helps with the blink. Improves the, improve the blink rate, which is going to help improve the ability to blink and get the myobum out of the oil glands. And at the same time, it heats the myobum. So it allows to be able to heat the myobum so that you can express. And the benefit is improving some of that tissue around the eye um, and the patients get a cosmetic benefit as well.
So we have neurostimulation is another um, form of treatment that's available. Um, there is a medication approved here in the U.S. about a year ago that uses a nasal spray to be able to um, simulate the lacrimal functional units to improve um, basal tear production. And so this is a great option for patients who don't maybe have the dexterity to put a drop in. They wear contact lenses. Um, and it's a good adjunct therapy, especially if I have those patients that try every drop and they fail. I sometimes have some good luck if I'm able to be able to prescribe this um, top, this nasal spray for them. And then there is a um, eye tier 100 that actually from externally stimulates the nasal lacrimal bundle to increase tear production. And then I'll do this side and I'll stop because I definitely want you guys to have time to be able to ask questions. But we use amniotic tissue therapy here as well. There's two types of amniotic membrane therapy. Uh, we have the wet, which is cryopreserve. The big one here in the U.S. is called Procara. And then there's the dry dehydrated. So bio, D, amio, disc, and optocyte. And what this does, it takes amniotic tissue and it's put into a disc form. And we know that this therapy works. It's not new to the eye space. It was used a lot in surgery to help with healing. But now we use it to help with inflammation um, more on a natural way to be able to re reduce um, signs of inflammation in the front part of the eye. It has natural proteins and cytokines. Um, these are some of the indications for ocular surface disease. I have really great success in my practice using, um, I use a dehydrated form of the amniotic disc therapy. Um, once again, it's an adjunct therapy. You put the discs um, on the ocular surface. They come usually in different sizes from five millimeters, sometimes up to 12. I use anywhere between an eight and five millimeter. It dissolves over about 72 hours, but what it does, it helps to restore the collagen bonds in that front surface. Um, and it's a good way to get some acute relief, especially if you have patients that are some of these topical medications that take a long time to get into the system, but you know that's going to be that chronic therapy, the chronic way to manage your condition. This is a good adjunct therapy to have to kind of jumpstart um, reducing inflammation and getting um, symptology reduced for patients. And so this is what the patient that I had earlier said, what do you do that's filled with everything? Um, I'm not good how, how good this shows up on your screen, but you can see the top there was a lot of inferior corneal staining with the sodium fluorescine, the tear breakup timers reduced. And so one thing I did, I did put her on that nasal spray, the Valcarin um, or Tivea, and I did an amniotic tissue treatment, amniotic membrane therapy on both eyes. And, um, you know, she was doing much, much better. And so um, in her regular chronic medication that she takes now is a nasal spray twice a day and artificial tears as needed. Um, and this is some uh, Regenerize, which is a hypotonic solution, um, which is another form to be able to topically offer medications for patients. This is considered almost kind of like the OTC um, it is not a prescribed therapy here where you have to write a prescription for it. And then lastly, blood-based therapies, autogelous serotears, tears, um, which was kind of the gold standard in um, creating blood-based drops for patients who had a lot of inflammation. In the beginning, it was kind of thought of you're in therapy, you've tried everything. Um, you know, they use blood that is drawn. So you usually have a nurse or phlebotomist come in and draw blood. Um, um, you dilute the blood with the sterile saline. Um, it does help reduce inflammation of front, sur versus a front surface of the eye. It has growth factors. Um, but we're learning now that platelet-rich plasma, um, PRP, um, it may be more effective on the front surface when managing signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. Because one thing is it's not diluted with sterile saline. So you get more or higher concentration of those growth factors and plasma factors which we know is the, really the good stuff, which you really want to keep and which is really going to help with the healing process and reduction of inflammation on the front surface of the eye as compared to a toggle of serum tears because you're diluting that. So you're losing a lot of the, the growth factors that really help, um, which is in the platelets, to improve the front surface of the eye. And this is just some studies that talk about um, growth factors in PRP and managing patients with dry eye disease. And there's some ways that you can get them. I think it's um, vital tears is for your toggle serum tears. And then um, my drop is a doctor who um, has come up with a great um, formulation to be able to draw the tears and know exactly what to use to be able to get those um, patient 
outcomes. And then lastly, um, observate. We talked about the neurosensory component. So we'll be learning more and more about neurotrophic keratopathy um, where patients are heavily symptomatic. There are a lot of pain. You look on the front surface of the eye and it's clear. And we're learning the dry eye disease at a long state, very chronic. It does cause loss of um, sensation. It affects the, the, um, the nerve endings. Um, on the front surface of the eye, there's a neurosensory component. So there's more therapies that are going to be coming out to help to be able to manage those patients. And then on the horizon, a lot of these things I have highlighted that now this year ago when I did this, they were in the pipeline. You can see now that those two that are highlighted, they're FDA approved in the U.S. for us to be able to use. And so take from this is that dry eye disease is here to stay. We're living longer. More people are affected younger by dry eye. So we're going to have to have a lot of research and therapies available to be able to practice um, properly manage our patients. These are some pitfalls um, that you may or may not have experienced. I'm not sure how you guys have drug coverage and things like that where you are. But main thing is you get your staff on board. A lot of this you see so much that it's nearly impossible for you just to manage on your own. Um, and it can be frustrating. A lot, of patients, a lot of doctors here in the U.S., it's hard to kind of figure out how they want to fit it into primary care because it takes a lot of chair time. But if you have a protocol, you kind of understand what some of the therapies are, where to go when things aren't working and stay abreast of some of the advanced treatments that are out, then you can manage your patients. Or what I say here, if that's not your thing, that's great. Refer um, refer to me. I'll take care of them. And I'll refer you. I'm not a big on pediatrics. And so I have a colleague that she's not big on dry eye. And I'm not big on pediatrics and vision therapy. So we just constantly refer and refer back to each other. So our patients are still well taken care of. But we are able to kind of use our expertise to be able to make sure we're properly managing our patients. So thank you for your time. And I'm going to, that's where my presentation ends. And I guess I'll open the floor for any questions and discussion? Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davison, for that. Uh, you know, I think you did cover the entire spectrum of dry eye management, starting <laughs> from the drops uh, to what is the latest available. And, in, and most importantly, I think the new things which are coming up and which have got recent FDA approvals as well. So that is something to be aware of because your patients are aware. <laughs> if you're not aware, then that's a problem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So the questions uh, Dr. Davison came in is, uh, what's your take or in how many patients do you do kind of combination therapy? So you do an IPL plus, you know, prescribe them warm compresses or you do an IPL plus uh, prescribe them artificial tears. So is it always there or uh, what's your thoughts over that? That's a very good question. I was saying my patients, that I catch early, you know, do I catch doing regular primary care because I'm already screening? Those patients, I don't necessarily have to do a lot of combination therapy. My foundation approach is um, in hygiene management, nutraceuticals, so I'm recommending a quality omega-3 and warm compresses. But I do get a lot of referrals. And so a lot of my referrals are moderate to severe. And I'm learning because of the definition is multifactorial. There's so many things that are happening. Um, inflammation, hyperosmolarity, neurosensory, that in most cases for me to get patients where they need to be, I do have to do combination therapy. So I may do my initial evaluation and consultation where I have all the tests that I run. So it's kind of like if you're being diagnosed with cancer. You know, they don't start treatment immediately. There's a bunch of tests that they run to kind of elicit specifically what type of cancer you have so that they can target the treatment. And a lot of times the treatment is multi-dimensional with managing um, cancer. And so dry eye is not cancer, but it's very multifactorial. So in most cases I'm doing the IPL. And once I finish the IPL, that same visit, I'm doing low light level therapy. I'm expressing the glands and then they're still at home taking their prescribed topical, topical medication twice a day. I usually say that my goal is the in office treatments that I'm doing eventually is going to reduce the things that they have to do at home. And so a lot of times when we reach those endpoints, then I'm done with my in-office treatments. They'll say, well, I'm much better. I only have to take my chronic medication twice a day um, to be able to keep my symptoms at bay. But that's a really good question. Awesome. Great. Uh, the, the other question, I think some of them are directly coming to me, so I'm just going to read them out to you. Uh, uh, the, about the follow-up. So what what is your uh, follow-up schedule for 
patients who are under dry eye management with you? Do you have a set protocol in terms of the follow-up schedule or uh, how do you kind of uh, see them? What's the frequency? That's a good question as well. So initial diagnosis right after I treat. So even if I initiate a home therapy, and especially if the patient is symptomatic, I usually see them in four weeks. So 30 days. I usually tell patients, you know, do this for 30 days. I need to see you back and I'll recheck numbers. So I'm always taking diagnostic numbers. And so you can equate it to other conditions that are managed. I use hypertension as an example. Um, start the medication. They take your blood pressure to have you come back in a month to see if your blood pressure has come down. So I usually have them come back in 30 days. Um, then after that, even if I do an IPL session, once I finish my fourth session, I have them come back in 30 days so I can repeat those numbers. Once we kind of hit baseline or reset. So for instance, if their symptoms are really daily, regularly scoring high on my ocular surface index score, I'm looking for reduction in symptology and reduction in those scores. Once I feel like I'm comfortable where the patient is much less symptomatic because they're not going to be cured. That's important. There's no cure. So are you symptomatic less of the time? Yes. Then I usually see them on a quarterly basis that first year. And then once we hit a year where I say that those scores are stabilized, then I usually see them every six months or once a year. If they're my patients, I usually say, let's see you for your annual in six months where I do your updated refractive exam, your updated dilation, strain for other diseases. And then six months after that, we do a dry eye focused visit. So in the beginning, it's a lot of visits. But once I get them managed or control, it's every six to 12 months. That's right. And uh, probably yeah. one more okay. question connected to this is uh, uh, what happens after they are better? So do you kind of recommend something like the maintenance therapy or uh, do you taper down the dosage or the therapy system for them? Or how? what's your take on that in terms of having them do after they have reached a certain level of uh, you know symptoms and they have some relief? Mm -hmm. So if they're taking medicine that I do kind of wean them off, a lot of patients don't like taking medicine forever, especially if they have other medicines. And so if they're top, taking top of a therapy, therapy and they're being in control for a while, usually it's a year, year and a half, then I start to scale back on the medicine and leave it kind of like an as needed. Um, if they're not taking prescribed medication, I always kind of have them know about those three lid management, nutraceuticals and warm compresses, and you can go in and out of way in tears, uh, supplemental. So I have dry eye in the same way. Like every day I'm not doing something, but if I have a flare up, then I know what to do to try to calm it down. And if not, same to my patients, if you try it for 48 hours, it hasn't calmed down, then come on in because then we may have to re up some of the medicines and things that we're doing. Um, but yeah, I, I usually get them where they're doing less <laughs> so that it can return to their daily life functions. Cause that's one of the frustrations with dry eye is so much you have to do that they overwhelmed and frustrated to keep their eyes comfortable. And so they really appreciate the fact that I, my goal is eventually get them where they're doing less to stay maintained. And there was a question that did pop up where I can see someone asks about what do you suggest for patients with Chauvin syndrome yeah. to relieve their dry eye? You, those are some of your tough patients to manage. You know, of course, it, usually here I'm able to prescribe, I look and see what they're um, how they're producing tears. You know, I do a Schirmer score, see how many tears they how much tears they have, look at their tear late. So I really focus on trying to increase basal tear secretion, more tears. Um, pump to plug therapy, I didn't have that on there, but that's another therapy that you can do. Um, some of your blood based therapy, specifically PRP, is showing promising um, effects on the promising outcomes on the front surface of the eye for patients that have Chauvin disease, um, uh, membrane therapy. But usually those patients are going to be your more uh, harder patients because if they're having any flare up in their condition, then their eyes are going to be very um, irritated at that state. I have one right now that is, uh, she constantly flares up, but that usually takes a lot of multiple therapies to try to get that patient where they're under control with um, Chauvin syndrome. That's right. Yeah. And uh, have you have you been able to prescribe scleral lenses as well for uh, severe dry eyes to protect the ocular surface? Yes. And have they worked yes. for you? Scleral well? lens therapy is an option as well for patients. And, um, you know, patients who are able to wear sclerals, who are motivated to wear sclerals, that's definitely an option, even if you're Chauvin syndrome patient, um, to be able to fit with sclerals. 
Um, a lot of my patients, I always present, you know, pretty much all the options. That's the option I did not have in my presentation. Um, but we kind of discuss and see what's going to make the most sense. A lot of my patients, you know, they're not interested in actually having put a contact lens in their eye regularly to be able to manage. But that's definitely an option for a more of your chronic state and ones who just don't have enough tear production. You just can't get that basal tear secretion to have that reservoir with the scleral lens is a, a fabulous option. Wonderful. Great. Uh, so I think with that, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davison, for sharing this Sunday morning and taking us through the entire uh, options for patients with dry eye. And as you said, dry eye is a common condition. We are seeing more and more patients suffering from it. So I guess we should be prepared uh, in what options do we have to offer to manage that uh, for them. So thank you so much you know, for accepting our invitation and uh, sharing the expertise with us today. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Uh, we do have session planned over the next weekend. So we will till then take care, be safe, and uh, see you in the next session. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Have a good day.